Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. My name's Tom Andrews, I'm from Sport England. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about the, uh, our new fund for three million pounds, which is the Tackling Inactivity and Economic Disadvantage Fund. Um, so this is, for us, uh, a very important part of our, our new strategy, which is contributing towards our vision of helping everybody, regardless of their background and their circumstances, to be able to feel like they can engage with sport and physical activity. So we're really trying to focus this funding on those from lower socioeconomic groups uh, and who, those who are facing um, more disadvantage in their lives. So we as an organization know that there's a big discrepancy between those who are rich and those who are poor in terms of the, their level of inactivity. So you're much more likely to be inactive if you're from lower socioeconomic groups. We also know that as an organization and as a sector, we don't know that much about those barriers in people's lives that prevent them from taking up that sporting offer. We've got a couple of organizations with us today that are trying to help us to understand that a bit more and to talk to you about lessons they've learned in terms of the work they've done over the past 10 to 15 years. They are sported and street games. Um, so today what we're gonna try and do is talk you through the objectives of the fund, how it's gonna work, how we're splitting up the funding and you're going to hear from a couple of our colleagues from Street Games and Sported just to talk to you about their ideas, about the lessons they've learned, and hopefully it's going to start triggering a few thoughts in your own heads about the projects you're running um, and whether they're suitable for this funding. Uh, so, um, can I just actually get, get a quick show of hands? Because you should have a couple of people on your tables with a white name tag on you. Uh, on. So, guys from, from uh, Sport England, just raise your hands. Guys from Street Games and guys from Sported. So what we're going to do later on is just break out into discussion groups on your table where there's a chance to just talk through your project ideas, ask any questions you've got, and uh, if you feel like there's support you can get from either Street Games or Sported, I'm going to put up some contact details for both those organisations later on, uh, and they may be able to support you with your project idea. So what do we want to achieve with this funding? So it's only three million pounds, but it's very, very important to us. So we're directing it very specifically to a couple of key areas. We really want this funding to be able to move people above that 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week to prevent them from being inactive. So we're really trying to focus this funding on those who are inactive. We also know that sport can be very powerful at bringing about wider social outcomes in local communities, particularly from lower socioeconomic groups. So we want you to be able to tell us how sport can have a wider impact in the communities in which you work. What uh, wider benefits can you bring about, such as improved com community cohesion, reducing crime rates, or improving mental well-being of, uh, of your residents? We also know that uh, because we don't know so much about the barriers that prevent people from taking up that active offer, how do we understand more about that? How can we develop, how can we structure our projects to best impact on uh, that inactivity issue? So how can we make people more, uh, how can we help people to be more active? We also know though that not every project that we fund through this funding is gonna be a success. We are trying to be a bit more um, risky with our funding. Uh, we are looking for projects that uh, have got great ideas and we are willing to try new ideas to see what's going to work. So we're willing to try um, a whole range of different types of projects. I wanted to talk quickly about what we actually mean by uh, inactivity. So I mentioned it very briefly, but it is. People who do less than 30 minutes of physical activity or sport each week, which makes them feel a little out of breath or have a higher heart rate. So this could depend, this level of activity could vary depending on your participants uh, physical well-being their, their base fitness level so we, we're throwing it wide open in terms of the activities that we're looking to fund we do have a couple of restrictions in terms of um, gardening or diy and things like that that we're, we're not going to be funding the, but we are throwing it wide open to a whole range of different types of activity I also wanted to talk quickly about what we mean by lower socioeconomic groups, because um, this is quite a complicated definition, and there's much more information about this in our prospectus. So I really encourage you to look 
into, uh, into that into a bit more detail if you want it. But we mean ordinary people and families who sometimes or often struggle to make ends meet. This includes those employed in semi-routine jobs like shop assistants, hairdressers, and bus drivers, and people in routine jobs like waiters, cleaners, and building laborers. It also includes people who are long-term unemployed who have never been employed. We know that this is a big and diverse group. This is about 12 million people, or about a third of the working population between 16 and 74 years old. It's not limited to those who face more extreme disadvantage, such as homeless or uh, drug, those facing drug or alcohol uh, addiction. So there's a, a massive group of the population here that we're trying to focus this funding onto. Um, we also know that the demand for sport and the, the, the wish to take part in sport is there. Um, about 70% of the, this group do want to take part in, in sport, but there are other barriers that uh, prevent them from taking up that offer. We know that then that's not just li limited to cost, but uh, it's a whole broad range of different issues that can prevent that offer being taken up. So we know that the majority of this group will be those who are living on low incomes uh, and who struggle to make ends meet. They may own their own homes, they may be busy working, um, and they may have qualifications. But it's a big and broad, diverse group. Why is this needed? Well, OK, so I wanted to talk quickly about um, the difference between those in the so higher socioeconomic groups, those at the top, and those at the bottom. The categorization NSEC, NSEC, I, I don't want to talk too much about this. It's a bit, this, this is the categorization we use to define socioeconomic status. As I mentioned, there's built more information about this in our prospectus. But this graph essentially says, if you are rich, you are much less likely to be inactive than if you are poor, those at the bottom. And the difference between the top and the bottom is almost double. And this difference is something that we as an organization really need to try and address. So I wanted to talk as well about how we're going to split out this funding. It's only three million pounds, but we are trying to direct it in very specific ways. So we've split it out into um, a couple of different pots. Um, so the first two, funding option A, is two million pounds for between 25,000 and 500,000 pounds. We're directing this at people who are in employment, but sometimes or often struggle to make ends meet. Um, funding option B is that £1 million pot, which we're directing at those who face more extreme disadvantage. So um, that of that 12 million group population that I mentioned earlier, we know the majority are, um, don't face that extreme disadvantage, which is why we're directing more of our money to that group. Funding option B, as I mentioned, to more people facing more ex extreme disadvantage, but that's for £25,000 up to £100,000. Both of these pots will go through a two-stage process. So you'll know that at the moment, our expression of interest um, application process is open, and we're accepting those applications. Um, for those projects that we, that we like, we'll take them through to the second stage uh, application process. So we're using that expression of interest process to really get a whole range of good project ideas. We're not so worried about strong applications. We're really interested to hear about your project ideas rather than to, uh, for you to work up your project plans and all your budgets and everything like that. It's just about your ideas at this stage. If you feel that your project is not quite ready to go just yet and it needs a little bit of work, then we may be able to use a development award to give you a bit of assistance. If, for example, you have a pilot project up and running, but you're not in a, pos in a position to do some effective measurement and evaluation, but you know it works, you know it's, it's a great idea, but you need something to prove your case, we may be able to use that development award to give you some expertise, to give you some capacity, to help you prove why that project works so you can develop it and expand it into the full project. We know that um, the outcomes for these types of projects can often take a long time to come about. So we're not setting a minimum time scale on these projects. Oh, sorry, we are setting a minimum, we're not setting a maximum. So we are asking for projects to last a minimum of one year, uh, but it's up to you to be able to tell us how long that project needs to run for to be able to achieve the outcomes that you want to come about. We would absolutely love for you to have some partnership funding 
and we would love for you to go out and work with your partners in your local community, but we're not putting a minimum requirement on partnership funding to be in place. It would be fantastic if you did, but we, um, it's not an absolute requirement. We are, though, focusing our funding on 16 years and plus, so we're focusing on that working age category, so between 16 years and 74 years old. That third option of funding, we're taking about 5% of the total pot and splitting it out for small awards for between £1,000 and £10,000. We know that for organisations working in these types of communities, often a small amount of money can make a massive difference. So we're really going to try and uh, throw this open to those types of projects um, and invite projects that have a, a small scope but can achieve a big outcome. This pot of funding will focus on both population groups identified in pots A and B. Again, though, we're not setting um, a maximum time limit on uh, these projects, but also not setting a minimum, so they can be as long as you like. Again, no partnership funding requirements, and again, we're, we're focusing on 16 years plus. This is a one-stage application process, though, so we're not inviting expressions of interest for these smaller awards you'll be taken through the uh, our small grants process, which is slightly separate to the expression of interest process we've got here. If you have any questions about the process for either of these three pots, please talk to one of us. We've got some grants experts in the room as well. Fire off any questions you've got as well to either our email address or our funding helpline, and we'll be able to help. So, what I want to do now is hand over to my colleague Graham from Street Games, who's gonna talk through um, some lessons learned that street games have picked up over the past 10 to 15 years to really try and help you uh, think about the types of projects you're running, try and spark off some ideas in your head. And then uh, my colleague uh, Joe from Sported is also going to talk to you. And afterwards, we're going to have a bit of table discussion just to talk through your projects and enable to you to ask any questions. Graham. Good afternoon. This fun's all right, isn't it? You're liking the sound of it so far? This idea of Sport England putting some money behind low socioeconomic groups, that sort of thing, inactivity. Street Games has got to love that because that's the DNA of our organisation. This is what we've been doing for the last 10 years. And I think it really resonates. I think I come from Burnley. You might be able to tell from the accent. And I think about Burnley a lot. Burnley's that place, you know, where we're currently sixth in the Premier League. Have you seen that? If we cash out today... Burnley is in Europe. Just think about that. Because most people in Burnley have never been out of Lancashire. But they could end up in Europe. Wow. And I think about people in Burnley, so I think about what it's like to live in Burnley, where, yeah, it's okay, I've got a job. Okay, it's part-time hours, it's flexi, it's zero hours. I have to wait for the phone to text me to say I've got some work today. Or somebody rings me up to say there's a bit of work tomorrow. So that sort of screws my time that I've got available to commit to a session or commit to go and join something because I don't know when I'm working. And I've got the kids and the kids are at school and that's all right because when they're at school, they sort of help out with the, with the free school meals. And that. But now when it gets to the holidays, I'm trying to feed the kids as well and I've not budgeted for that. So actually, I haven't got a lot of cash left to actually join anything or pay for anything, to go and do anything. Wow. And I'll tell you the biggest stress I've got at the moment growing up living in Burnley. I'll tell you what really impacts on my time at the moment. Coronation Street has gone to six episodes a week. I can't keep up. I really can't. Even with catch up and all that, I can't keep up. I'm miles behind. So if I've got half an hour spare, I'm going to go and go out and do something or I'm going to watch an episode of Corrie and keep up. And I guess that sort of target market is maybe where you're thinking about this, uh, this, this project idea. And you'll have loads and loads of project ideas in the room, I'm sure of it. I'm absolutely convinced of it. My job is probably going to challenge you, provoke you. I might end up smashing your idea right out the wall. And I'm sorry about that if I do that. But it's important. You've got to understand why those people in Burnley might want to come to your activity. Why would they want to come in? What are they going to turn up for? What's the reasons? What's their motivations for coming? Is it that they want to get active? 
Is it that he wants some time away from the kids? Is it that he want to come and do something with people on the street? Do you want to do something with people like themselves? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but you've got to understand it. You're going to have to go out there and find people that know people. You're going to have to go and sup a lot of cups of tea with people to find out why would they want to come? What's their motivation? We asked some people, we'll show you up on the screen, this was one of our sessions. This is what people told us, for, this was like a, a further education session. We asked people why they want to come, look at it, it's interesting. Look at the lads, look at the girls who split it up. For this particular session, all the top stuff, be it lads or be it girls, is all about fitness, it's about health, it's about losing weight, it's about growing muscles, it's about looking good. Do you know why? Shall I tell you why? Because this summer, four million people spent every day watching Love Island. That's why. That's why. Everybody wants to look like Marcel. It's not real. Sorry to destroy that illusion for you. It's not real. You can't possibly look like Marcel. It's your telly playing tricks. If you come to Street Games Projects till the cows come home, you won't look like Marcel. And who would want to anyway? But if that's their motivation for coming, we need to acknowledge that. We need to start to do some stuff with that. Perhaps it's going to be your role to introduce other benefits of coming. So, all right, even if you don't look like Marcel, is it good to have a bit of time away from the kids? Is it good to meet somebody from next door? Is it good just to come and have a bit of time out? Do you feel a bit better about doing stuff? Them's the conversations. Compete, look where compete came. For the lads, it's right down. Lots of people in the world of sport would swear blind that people want to get into teams and enter leagues. That wasn't our experience. There's a danger. They come, they enter a team, they enter the league, they turn up, match day one, all feeling really good about it. And they get tated 10-0. They get beat. A lot of people in this cohort that were targeting with this funding, at times life's beating people. The situation of work is beating them, the money is beating them. So we don't want to beat them. We want to be along with them. But challenge, challenge figured quite strongly for us. Group challenge, challenging ourselves as a group to do something was really important. Girls, girls, mums, aunties, daughters, grandmas, friends coming together to challenge themselves to do a race for life. That was massive. Not because they woke up that morning and thought, here, I just want to go and run a 5k race. No, 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 no. They wanted to do something for a charitable reason, for an emotive reason. That was their motivation. They wanted to do it as a group and they wanted to challenge themselves and I'll prove it. Go and watch something like a race for life and I'll guarantee that most people cross the finishing line together, holding hands, achieving as a group. Really powerful stuff. So if you understand why people want to come, their motivations, your job is going to be to develop the offer for them, to meet those motivations, to meet those wants. I'm going to make this really easy for your bids. I'm going to talk about four rights. And maybe I'll talk about a fifth right at the end as well. And if you remember this stuff, as you're working up your idea, you won't go far wrong. Whatever it is you deliver needs to be in the right place. Now, the right place isn't necessarily your glossy new leisure centre because you've got some space in it. It's not your wonderful community sports facility because you've got some spare pitch time. It's the right place for your participants. Where did they feel okay about going? Where did they feel that they fit in? Where is it local? Where can they just turn up? Where can they access it without a transport barrier? Where are the less rules? If I go to my leisure centre at the moment, there's so many rules. I don't even understand the wording of some of the rules. So that's not going to work. Have a look at some of these places that we've got here. We've got a car park. I'll take you to a car park in Uddersfield in Yorkshire. A supermarket car park. And at four o'clock on a Sunday when the supermarket ceases trading, a cricket league starts. It's fabulous. There's teams from all over coming playing cricket. Four o'clock till six o'clock every Sunday. Why? 
because it's flat, because it's drained, because it's lit. This sounds better than most of the playing fields that we can access, doesn't it? Even better now, the supermarket manager leaves them sandwiches and water as well. Fabulous. Car park cricket. Look at the community centre. I think she's boxing and dancing in the picture. I'll take you to a community centre in Cheshire, run by a housing association, where a group of mums said, we want to get together and do some stuff. And the housing association said, what do you need? They said, we need the community centre and we need some curtains. And they went down the community centre, they drew the curtains, so it was really dark in the room, they put the tunes on, they cracked the glow sticks, and they raved around for an hour. What an amazing project. Really, really worked. But look out, danger. Here comes the local sports development unit, going to over-organise it, going to introduce a coach to it and an instructor. Danger, danger, danger. That was working. Let them get on with it. Let them get on with it. Wow, the right place. Look at the beach. What's the beach like in Ealing? Is it nice? Nice when the tide's in. When it's sunny, people want to go to the beach. Move the activity. Move what you're doing. Move what you're doing. Where do people want to be? Take it to them. Whatever you do needs to be at the right place, driven by the participants, not driven by you. Whatever you want to do needs to be at the right price. Wow. So this is great. Sport England are giving out some quids. You've got to love it. But as we all know, we've got to try and keep this stuff going. So you're going to charge. You're going to charge 50p. You're going to charge a pound. What are you going to do? Let me share with you some research. Street Games colleagues will share this with you if you want to see it. It's an open document. Sheffield Hallam University. The average family living in an area of deprivation as a family unit has every week to spend on leisure activities £2.55 as a family. So you know when your swim is now nearly £5, that's half a person. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. £2.55. So maybe 50p works. Or maybe does it really matter? Sometimes it's better just to get the group going. And eventually, they might be able to support themselves and generate their own money. We've got groups of people from homeless hostels that rather than paying 50p once a month to do a car wash, that raises enough money to keep the project going. And it's not a car wash, it's just a water fight with sponges. And there just happens to be cars in the way. It works, it's fabulous. Your activity needs to be the right price. Moving on. Your activity needs to take place at the right time. Now, the right time isn't when you've got that spare hour in the sports centre. Your right time is not because your rota says that's when it should be. Managers will hate me. Most do. It's all right. The right time is what works for the participants. The right time of the day, the right day of the week. Look at the activities. Look at the mums doing the buggy push. And I know one of the buggies hasn't got a kid in it. You don't have to have a kid to do a buggy push. You just need a buggy. Anybody want to take a guess what time that buggy push took place? What time did that activity take place? What time? On the school run. Nine o'clock in the morning, absolutely. Nine o'clock was the right time. So if they're on the school run, where's the right place? School gate. School gate. The right time, the right place, they all link up. Better to do it at nine o'clock at the school gate than try and do it at the leisure centre two miles up the road at 10 a.m. Because the problem is between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m., walking that two miles, at about 25 past nine, your participants will be walking past their houses. And there's a big temptation in life at 25 past nine every morning. What is it? Jeremy Kyle. Isn't it? That'll win. That'll win. I'll let you into secret. Jeremy Kyle's on ITV2 in the afternoons. But you knew that anyway, didn't you? You knew that. The right time really matters. Think about those people. We talked about low-wage workers. Think about those who work shifts. They work changing times. And they're a good team this season. Watch them. 
they'll be getting promoted. When do the matches take place? They look at when they're on shift together. If they're on nights together, kickoff is 6 a.m. at the end of the shift. If they're on earlies together, kickoff is at 2 p.m. at the end of the shift. If they're on lates, kickoff is at 10 p.m. at the end of the shift. It works for them. But look out, here come the sport development team trying to over organise it, trying to put it into a structure and a league and enter something local. It won't work. Because what pivots on that activity is it's about when them teams can do it. It's an amazing league. And the bosses don't know anything about it. Fabulous. Works a treat. Your activity needs to be at the right time. Finally, your activity needs to take place with the right style. So a varying activity is good so people don't get bored. Do you think you need to play sport or activity with all the right rules? Do you need to use all the rules? Does it really matter? You look at cricket, there's so many rules for cricket. Someone's telling me you can play handball now with five rules. That's all right, I can remember that. I can remember five things. I can't remember War and Peace, which is the cricket rule directory. I can't do it. Do you need to wear the right clothing to engage in sport? What do we think? Room's got a bit quiet. Look at the lady doing fencing. What's she got on her feet? She's got Uggs. You'll not see that at the Olympics, will you? Here come the Great Britain team coming out to fence in their Uggs. Does it matter? Does it bunk them? Look at the girl with a bag turning up for football. A street-based football session. She turns up with a bag, can I play? So they've got a problem because that bag is a little bit of an health and safety thing. She might get hurt. So they say, we can play, but we could do to do something with your bag. I'm not putting my bag down. I've got my phone in my bag. It's like my third arm. Okay. Rather than turning it away, they said, are you good with your phone? She said, oh, brilliant with my phone. Could you help us with our project? We've got one of these tablet things, but we're not great with it. Could you take a few pictures of this football session? Maybe a little bit of film. They left her with it 40 minutes later. Photos, film footage, music stretched underneath it. They've made a promotional DVD. She'd done it. And I bet she was a lot cheaper than these lads who are doing it here today. I bet you. Sorry, lads. The right style of activity really matters. It's what the people want, not what you think. So your activity is going to take place in the right place because that's what the participants want. It's going to be at the right price because that's what they can pay for it. It's going to be in the right time. It's when they can do it. And it's the right style. It's what they want to do, wearing what they want, using what rules they want. It doesn't really matter as long as they're doing something. The four rights. But I'm missing the fifth one. What's that most important right of all? It's not about the right place, the style, the price, the time. It pivots on the right people. Absolutely. The right people is essential for this. You're probably sitting out there Proud as punch because you've just qualified as a level 37 badminton coach. And good luck to you. Brilliant. But there is nothing in sport, in sports coaching, that says just because you are a level 37 badminton coach means that you'll be fantastic at this work. You might be, but it doesn't come as a given. The right people for this are the people with the skills and qualities around empowering, around getting alongside, around being trusted, around being passionate about being able to communicate, about being a leader in the community, being a Pied Piper, having the ear of the people. I think you've got to go and work really hard. I think you've got to go out there between now and that 6th of November closing date and you've got to go find the right people. We did a road show in Middlesbrough in a community centre. The lady that run that community centre, she was the right person. She knew everybody. She was so trusted by the community. That's amazing. You've got to harness that. That's far more important. Get the right people shaping it, doing it, leading it, motivating others, and you won't go far wrong. I'll leave you with a quote. It says young people because my background's in youth work, but you can delete the word young. It doesn't matter. People need to care, need to know you care before they care what you know. People need to know that you are bothered about them. 
that you're interested in their lives, that you're interested in seeing them, that you're motivated and passionate by them turning up and being part of it and you're understanding them. And then, and only then, will your participants be bothered that you've just qualified as a level 37 badminton coach. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Graham. I think it's so good to get some, some real-life examples around the sorts of people um, that this fund's targeted at and the sorts of people that you'll be working with to engage. Um, and now I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, actually applying for the funding and some of the stuff that you might want to put in your, um, in your application. Um, so my name's Jo. I'm from Sported. Here we go. Um, we have got some Sported members in the room, which is great, but some of you may not have heard of Sported before, so I'm just going to give you a brief introduction about who we are. Um, and then I also want to talk um, briefly about a project that we undertook called Bridging the Gap, um, which was a research project which hopefully will give you some, some really good advice and some tips uh, when you're applying for your funding. So Sported have been um, supporting organisations like yourselves um, and a lot of smaller organisations, clubs and groups that have been working in disadvantaged areas across um, England for coming up 10 years. Um, our 10th anniversary is in, in March. And in 2015, we partnered with Sport England on this project called Bridging the Gap. And the aim was to kind of draw out some of the lessons that we've learned working with these groups. Um, but also to summarise some tips about how you can effectively work um, in low, with low socioeconomic groups um, and with inactive people. And then the idea that was that we wanted to share this research with groups like yourselves and other people that want to use sport for wider social change. So I'm going to talk a bit more about bridging the gap in a minute. Um, but firstly, just to give you a little bit of information about Sported. Um, so you can see on, on our slide there, we've, we're a membership organisation, a free charity membership organisation. And we've got just over 2,500 members across England. And 847 of those are in the bottom 20% most deprived neighbourhoods. So our experience is really working with those groups. And that's um, it's about 34% of our membership. For, my, for many of our members, their primary purpose is to support positive social change, so it's not necessarily about the sport. Sport is actually used to achieve these outcomes, so sport's often secondary. Um, so things like uh, reducing crime and antisocial behaviour and improving mental health and well-being, they're their kind of focus activities, um, and they're using sport in order to do that. So we call this sort of things, and it's these, these five down here, there are sport for development outcomes. And these are of particular interest with regard to the tackling inactivity and economic uh, disadvantage fund. So these are the sorts of things that when you're putting your application in, you've really got to show that you're targeting an inactive people, but what are the wider social benefits of that as well. You can see that many of our members are small, um, with a turnover of less than £5,000 per year, and two-thirds of them are entirely volunteer-led. But despite that, they have an immense amount to offer people in this room, um, but also the wider sort of community sports system about how to engage people who are inactive and how to engage lower socioeconomic groups. Like many of you here today, they're really rooted in their communities, they know the challenges that local people face, many of which Graham's al already discussed, and they're really trusted and respected um, by local people. And th that is just something that's so vital for this fund because many of you here today are well rooted in your communities, you do know your audience, and it's just really important that you showcase that when you're putting your application together. So based on that, what we did for Bridging the Gap was um, we decided to actually go out and ask our groups and ask these, um, these community organisations and these members for their thoughts, their advice and their feedback. And over two years, we interviewed 98 clubs and groups and then 14 larger agencies. And the reason it was called Bridging the Gap was because we felt there was so much support and so many agencies out there trying to help these groups and so many groups trying to work with 
um, inactive people and people from areas of disadvantage, but they weren't working together. And so our research was trying to bridge that gap to try and allow them to access the support that was out there. So we consolidated all of our findings, um, which was transcripts and transcripts of hours of interviews that we did with these people, um, into a toolkit called the Blueprint for Engagement. So it shows you how you can engage with those groups, how you can work with the bottom 20%. It takes you on a seven step journey, which is this here. And I'm not gonna go into it in, in too much detail because many of you have already taken this journey many times, you're already working with these groups. Um, but it is available on our sporty website and we'll circulate it afterwards so you can see some of the findings from that. I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail of a, on a couple of these. So the first one, motivation. So why are you applying for this fund? How does reaching inactive people link to your organisation's wider aims and objectives and your overarching strategy? So you'll know that and you'll know why you're coming here today and why you want to apply for the fund but it's important that you put that in your application. So Sport England may not know you, they may not know the work that you do. So when you're applying for the fund, you really need to show how working with these groups is important to you and how it links to your wider organisation. The second one I want to draw on is the understanding the challenge. Um, so knowing the community and the targets, so the inactive groups or the low socioeconomic groups, it's really important that you demonstrate that you understand these people, that you work with them, um, that you understand the challenges that they face. Um, you may work with them on a real sort of hyper-local level on a day-to-day -day basis, and you need to explain that to Sport England to tell them um, so that they really get that you understand them. Um, and, and if so, how will your project therefore help these people or, or help perhaps achieve um, some wider social uh, affect wider social problems. Um, also focus, the fourth one at the, uh, near the bottom there. So knowing what you want to achieve, is it just about physical inactivity for you? And that's fine, it's, it's for, to, in, um, to attract inactive people. Or is it about the wider social outcomes that come as part of that as well? So how will your project achieve those outcomes? And you really need to drill down to show the work that you're gonna do and how it's actually gonna affect those outcomes. And then lastly, um, the one here, on, just on the left-hand side for you, um, radical partnership and collaboration. So you're going into disadvantaged communities to help tackle issues that really affect people's day-to-day -day lives. So it's big for them. Um, and the problems they face have many causes and may show up in many different ways. So it may be that just one intervention or one organisation on their own is not going to be enough to actually make these changes and that you will have to work in partnership with others. So I think applications are more likely to be successful if they're um, in collaboration with other people. And you know, a key element of the fund is, is willing to work with others and in partnership so that we can really tackle some of this stuff. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, we've got three members of the team from Sported here today. Um, and as I say, we will circulate the blueprint following today and it's also um, available on our website. Um, we'll be around on the three of us on different tables so we can chat to you um, and thank you to everyone for listening. Cheers Joe, thank you Graham. Um, okay so, whoop, we go. Um, before we go into our discussions on our tables I wanted to talk quickly about um, whether this fund is right for you, and just recap a few points. Hopefully, though, both of those discussions have got a few ideas going in your head. You've got ideas going around about uh, the types of projects you can run, the types of audience you want to engage with. But I wanted to make a point, though, that this is, uh, this is for three million pounds, this part. It's not a huge amount of money. And we do expect competition to be, to be high. You know, this is... Uh, a huge target audience, as I, as I mentioned. Now, there are a lot of uh, organizations like yours who are doing a lot of work like this. So we do expect this competition to be high. So if you don't feel that your project is matched perfectly with this, that's fine, that's okay. There's support out there from organizations like Sported and Street Games to help you to uh, investigate alternative sources of funding. But know this, it's likely that this 
funding part is going to influence our future funding program. So the, the, there's likely to be um, further funding opportunities going forward. So if you feel you're, like you're, you're not quite ready, that's fine. That's no problem. So yes, this fund is right for you if, and these all relate back to our three objectives that I mentioned at the beginning. If you work with individuals from low socioeconomic groups and recognize the benefits of being active. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a sporting organization or that you've used sport before. And we have a broad range of organizations in the room today that reflect that. It's not just sporting organizations. Um, but if you recognize the benefits that sport can bring, fantastic, we want to hear from you. You can show how you will target inactive people. So all this funding comes back to bring people who are inactive above that 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. You have ideas about how to use activity to improve lives or support positive change. Again, so that second objective, bringing about wider social outcomes. We really want to hear from you if you've got a project idea that's going to do that. And you are willing to work in partnership with others where appropriate to develop and strengthen your project. So we know that partnerships can really help to strengthen the outcomes that you want to achieve. They can link you into parts of the community that you don't necessarily have access to, and they can really help to strengthen your project. We really want to hear from you if you've got a good partnership in place already and it's something you want to develop. So this funding is not for you, though. If you work with a wide range of, of people, including lots of people coming from higher socioeconomic groups, so we really want to focus this funding on those from a lower socioeconomic community. And the majority of individuals are already doing more than 30 minutes of activity. So again, it's really focused on those who are inactive. Your project is about providing a particular sport or activity to everyone rather than targeting a particular audience. And your project is mainly about finding and supporting people with a particular talent in sport. So those level 37 badminton coaches, if your project is uh, geared up towards identifying those people who have the potential to become those coaches or be become extremely talented in sport, this funding is not necessarily for you. We're not trying to um, bring about massive um, habits in uh, physical activity. This is just about introducing physical activity um, in what could perhaps be three blocks of 10 minutes per week. It's not a huge amount of physical activity, so it's just getting above that threshold. It's not a massive amount. And if your project is particularly focused at uh, children or young people under the age of 16, um, this funding is not necessarily for you. If though your research suggests that involving children and young people uh, as a family unit or with adults can help to um, bring those adults above that 30 minute threshold, then we are interested in hearing from you. But your beneficiaries need to be primarily those adults in that group and not the children and young people. So a couple of dates for your diary. I want to focus on the top lines, really, though, that, that 6th of November, that's the key date for your diary at the moment. That's when your expression of interest needs to be with us. That's when your small award applications need to be with us. Um, beyond that, don't worry too much, because you'll have a chance to develop your application uh, for stage two if you get to that, to that point. Um, if you feel, though, that your um, project is going to need a bit of work, and this process is all about developing um, it, and inviting good ideas, not necessarily strong, well thought out projects. So if you feel that it's going to need a bit of development to get to that point, there's a later submission point for uh, stage two applications. So don't worry if you feel like it's going to be a lot of work. We can give you some support to get to that point where you're ready to submit. OK, so um, now I uh, just want to, uh, to invite some discussion and some questions. So pick out the guys on your table. You've got the, the white badges. Fire off any questions and talk through your project ideas with them. Thanks very much. OK, cheers, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Um, it sounds like there's loads of discussions still going on. So there's no rush. There's, you don't have to stop. You don't have to uh, leave any time soon. We've got a bit of time before uh, our first session comes along later. But I'll put up some contact details in the meantime and some key dates for your diaries. So as I mentioned, the 6th of November is the key date you need to work to. Um, Support from Street Games and, and Sported, if you're interested in contacting them and you haven't worked with them before, I've got some email addresses up there. Really, really would encourage you if you haven't before. Uh, and details about our website and our email address and our funding helpline. 
If you've got any questions whilst you're completing your expression of interest, please give those guys a ring on the helpline, drop us an email, and we'll be more than happy to help. Our prospectus is on our website. Really recommend you go through that in as much detail as you can. The assessment principles are included in, in the back of there, so that's what we're going to be uh, judging your expressions of interest against. Um, but thank you all very much for coming along. You have absolutely nothing to lose by putting in an expression of interest, even if you're thinking, oh, I'm not so sure. Please, please, please send us your great ideas. This process was all about sending us fantastic ideas that we want to try and develop into good projects. Best of luck, and thank you very much for coming. Safe journeys home. Thank you. Just talking about eligibility.